I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Ingo Brosh. Am I saying your name right? Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, Ingo is the assistant professor uh, in the Department of Integrative Biology in the College of Natural Science. He's originally from Germany, where he studied biology and received his PhD from the University of Würzburg in Bavaria. He then worked as an Alexander von Humboldt and Volkswagen Foundation postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oregon in Eugene before joining the MSU faculty in 2016. His research focuses on investi investigating the genetic genomic basis of developmental processes and their relation to the evolution of vertebrate animals as well as human biology and disease using different fish species as model organisms. Since arrival at MSU, he has established two fish research facilities on campus. Dr. Brosh's contributions to multiple genome sequencing projects have been instrumental to under understanding the evolution of fish genomes and how they compare to our own. He led the International Consortium for the Analysis of the Garfish Genome, which was published in 2016 in Nature Genetics, and his lab is currently leading the efforts to develop the GAR in combination with zebrafish into a new model system for biomedical research. It may be puzzling to consider why a fish would be a good model system for uh, human medicine, but after all, we're all genetic machines, and sometimes a piece of our genetic machinery is also present in another animal species like a fish, and by studying the fish, you can do things to the fish you can't do to us. Uh, one can learn about humans. Dr. Brosh's research has been published in more than 50 papers, including in Nature, Nature Genetics, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and he is supported by the National Institutes of Health. Welcome, Ingo. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shu, uh, for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity today to talk about the research in my lab in the Department of Integrative Biology. So in Integrative Biology, we study life in context at all levels of biological organization, ranging from molecules, molecules to ecosystems. And specifically in my lab, I want to understand how the genome of an animal encodes the information to build an animal body, building its morphology, and how then changes to the genome and changes to morphology over longer evolutionary timescales leads to biodiversity among animals. And obviously the study object in my research are the fishes that, as you all know, are tremendously diverse. So there are more than 30,000 species uh, of species on this planet. And when we look in a little bit more detail, we see two major groups of fishes. As you can see here on the left side, the so-called rayfin fishes, which contain the majority of biodiversity of fishes. And to the right side, we see the so-called lobefin fishes, which are also very important because they contain the group of land vertebrates, including our own lineage, uh, the human lineage. So after all, uh, we also evolved from fishes. And using this framework, my research addresses three different main topics. The first one is I want to understand what mechanisms lead to this biodiversity in the fishes, in the modern fishes, which make up almost 50% of all vertebrate animals. Secondly, I want to learn by the comparison of fishes to the land vertebrates more about our own ancestry, our uh, legacy from, from these fish uh, ancestors. And finally, we want to use the modern fishes as model systems to learn more about human disease and biomedical questions. And the most common um, biomedical model fish species is the zebrafish that is also used in my lab. And here you can see a video of the, a time lapse video of the first day of life of a zebrafish embryo. You saw a few cell divisions on the top of the egg, and now these cells move around the yolk ball in the middle. And uh, within a few hours, you can see already a head on the top uh, developing now. The, the eye should show up there. Um, and we have a trunk, a body with body segments, and we have a tail also forming. And remarkably, this 20 hours old zebrafish embryo looks very similar to a human embryo of only 30 days of age, 
which also has a head, it has an eye, it has body segments, it has a tail and so on. So these similarities of a zebrafish and a human uh, embryo and its development are very suitable then to analyze more about vertebrate uh, biology and also genetically fish and human are very similar and we can make use of this to study biomedical questions. So here's an example from some of my colleagues that found that the same gene in a fish and the same gene in a human, when mutated, can lead to the uh, uh, disease of cleft palate. So cleft palate is a very common birth uh, defect in humans. And now we can use fishes to study this process in more detail. Zebrafish is not the only study uh, object for this kind of bi biomedical research. Other species are, for example, the platy fish, which is prone to develop skin cancers. Um, so we can study the formation and the spread of melanoma in an animal body using this kind of fish. Since arrival at MSU, my lab, in collaboration with a group of Julia Gens, also in integrative biology, we have established a state-of-the-art fish facility in Giltner Hall, um, which has the capacity to uh, keep about 10,000 fish at the moment and we use these fish now to study gene functions and to develop fish models for human diseases using techniques such as genome editing, transgenics and high resolution imaging and with these methods we can literally, literally make zebrafish go green. Um, so uh, as you can see here by labeling specific nerve cells for example in the brain uh, we can um, highlight specific uh, cell types also shown on this on this video in the bottom um, where uh, specific cell types uh, that line the gut are highlighted and then my research um, uses a threefold approach um, to these questions so from bottom to top we sequence, analyze, and compare, compare multiple fish genomes um, to learn more about the genomic organization of fish genomes and how they encode genes. And then we study different fish model species, such as zebrafish, to learn more about the development and what these genes do to, um, to develop specific body parts and what happens if you mutate specific genes and what this does to the development of the fish. And then we put all this back in an evolutionary framework to reconstruct how the last common ancestor of fish and human may have looked like in its morphology and also in its genomic architecture. And it's very important to keep in mind if we want to use these modern fishes as biomedical models to, uh, for human disease, that we are able to identify these ancestral components of the fish genome um, that uh, were already present in the last common ancestor of fish and man and distinguish those from the changes that have occurred independently in both lineages, which are now relatively derived. Um, so, for example, the morphological changes that occurred when um, fishes emerged to become land vertebrates, or the genomic changes that happened um, in the modern fishes, where we have a, a, the occurrence of a so-called genome duplication, which means that fishes now tend to have additional copies of genes uh, that we see in single copy in the human genome. And the way around this problem is that we study in my lab now fish species that are less derived, such as the gar fishes. So what are gars? Um, gars have already been recognized a long time ago for their archaic body plans. So Charles Darwin called them living fossils because the living species, such as spotted gar, that is studied in my lab, resemble long extinct uh, species from the fossil record. A few years back, we sequenced the genome of the gar, and we also now can keep the gar in the laboratory. Um, so we can study their development and compare that to the zebrafish development and to human development. And we have established a facility on campus so that we can keep these fish and study their biology in, in much detail. And to give you a brief summary of what we have found is that we can use this gar now to connect the sometimes disparate worlds of, of humans and tetrapods and the modern fishes. So on the one hand, at the genomic level, the gar is way more similar to the human lineage than the modern fishes. And by this, we can translate genomic information from human into the world of fishes to the gar. And because the gar develops as a fish, of course, we can then compare that to the modern fishes. And thereby, we can learn a lot 
about the evolution of vertebrates in general, but also this helps us to develop disease models because we can transition now with high precision genomic locations in the human genome to the modern fish genome, to the zebrafish, where people then can study human disease uh, loci in high, in, in high uh, precision. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all the members of my laboratory um, that are involved in this uh, effort, many undergraduate students that help us with our research in, and in our fish facilities, collaborators on campus and worldwide, funding sources, and of course you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. What, what uh, majors of, are the students? I mean, do we have an array of different uh, backgrounds that you have yeah. in your lab? So we have uh, students that study zoology. We have students that study zoo and animal, and animal sciences. Uh, we have students that come from the fisheries and wildlife. So I think we have a broad array of students from, from multiple departments and even colleges that we can involve in our research. Is that lab with 10,000 fishes, that's, is that one well, of the largest that exists anywhere? No, it's a moderate-sized um, facility um, that serves the needs of two labs right now. But we have built in uh, space so we, that we can expand in the future and go to about 15,000 fish at some point. Interesting. Dr. Rush, thank you. Thank you.